Why do the very existence of Palestinians in Palestine remain so hotly contested by Israel and its apologists? What do we know about the actual historical development of these terms and the realities they represent? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Moain Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Dr. Zachary Foster. Zachary Foster earned his PhD in Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. His dissertation is entitled The Invention of Palestine, and he is a director of product at academia.edu. Dr. Zachary Foster, 104 years to the day after the Balfour Declaration was issued, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, maybe we should start with a, a very basic question, which is when and why did Palestine and Palestinian become such politically contested terms? So I can start with Palestine and then uh, do the Palestinians. Uh, and, Sounds good. And so I think the first instance where we see Zionists bothered by the word Palestine is already in the 1920s. So the British colonial government decided to print the word Palestina in Hebrew on coins and stamps and bills. And what happens as a result of this is the Zionists want the British colonial government to use the phrase Eretz Israel in Hebrew rather than Palestina in, in, in Hebrew. And so as far as I can tell, that is the first instance where we start to see murmurings or rumblings of a controversy over the word Palestine. Um, but I would say that it's not really until the 1930s that we, we really see a, 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 a we, we really see movement on the uh, Zionist side. Um, and so you have this writer, his name is Mikhail Asaf, and he publishes this book in 1936. I think it's called The Arab Movements in Palestine. And, um, and in this book, um, Asaf uh, claims that Palestine had never existed in Arab history as a unit in and of itself. And instead, Arabs considered this uh, land part of the land of Sham. And, and he claims as well that- Exactly, it, 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 for, it, that the that the Arabs called it Syria or or the land of Sham, Bilad de Sham, um, and in fact that they always uh, emphasized that the name was Southern Syria rather than Palestine. And I know we're going to get back to the whole Southern Syrian episode in a little bit, but this is really the first instance that I've been able to find where uh, Zionists are are trying to. Um, undermine the local connection to Palestine. And I think the reason is pretty obvious here. It's that they realized that it, um, in order to take over Palestine, that the Zionists would need to break the local bonds to Palestine. And one way to do that is obviously by undermining even the names that locals use to describe the land. And so, um, but, but I think it's worth emphasizing as well that at this early, in this early period in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, Palestine is basically uncontroversial. Um, you could say Asaf was an innovator in his desire to try and undermine the local connection to Palestine at this point in time. But for the most part, remember, Palestine is the name of the country. It's, um, it's the name of the government. It's not printed on coins and stamps and bills. It's the word used by the entire international community to describe the land. So it's still relatively uncontroversial at this point. And I would say that that really starts to change um, in the years after uh, the establishment of the state of Israel. So Bernard Lewis. After 1948. Exactly, after 1948. And so I think uh, the, the key, the pivotal player in this movement to, um, yeah, to, to make the word Palestine and the, the idea of the Palestinian people controversial is Bernard Lewis, okay? And in 1975, Bernard Lewis writes this magnum opus, this 15,000 word essay in Commentary Magazine, a kind of sweeping history of Israel-Palestine. And it's Bernard Lewis, so he loves names, he loves etymology. And, and so this is, I, I, I just want to quote a, a couple of sentences from that piece, Please. Um, because I think it's really critical to understanding how this term became this controversial, this contested term. Um, and so he, this Sorry, is literally... if I just before you do that, um, yeah. Bernard Lewis was, of course, um, the primary, um, uh, the leader, let's say, of Middle Eastern studies at Princeton. Did you overlap with him or had was he already retired by the time you got there? 
So my first year at Princeton was 2011, and that was the very first year that Bernard Lewis did not give the inaugural oh, lecture. Mm. So I was, I, I think, yeah, had I had I started a year earlier, I would have probably had a chance to meet him. But mm. at that point, I think he had already moved to uh, Philadelphia, and I think he was, you know, he, he was quite old at that point, right? So this is, what, 10 years ago or so. He was already well into his 90s, I think. So he, he was no longer really active, um, right. e even, even in the years prior. But right. um Hey, I just wanted to clarify that. So. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is how Bernard Lewis starts off that, uh, that commentary magazine essay. He writes, the name Palestine is first attested in the history of Herodotus and appears in the works of later Greek and Latin writers, uh, quote, from the end of the Jewish state in antiquity to the beginning of the British rule, the area now designated by the name Palestine was not a country. It had no frontiers. It was a group of provincial subdivisions within a larger entity, and he continues to write that uh, British Palestine was, quote, abhorrent. He uses the word abhorrent to Muslims for whom there was no such thing as a country called Palestine. And here's another quote, quote, for a long time, organized and articulate Arab political opinion was virtually unanimous on this point. Okay, and unanimous on this point that Arabs that uh, uh, Arabs and especially Muslims considered Palestine abhorrent. Um, so which is, they called it Eretz Yisrael or or what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I, I think Bernard Lewis would claim they probably called it Bilad Sham, the land of mm -hmm. Sham, or Syria. But um, but but obviously, what, what he's saying is just is, is just com complete nonsense. It, it it's it's so ridiculous that. I, I don't think I've found even a single Arab Muslim writer who's abhorred by the word Palestine, um, let alone it being the unanimous and articulate Arab public uh, political position. Um, so in any case, uh, Bernard Lewis repeats this claim over and over again in multiple pieces he wrote over the years from the 70s onward. Uh, um, he has, I think, a piece specifically called like History of the Name Palestine. And, uh, and he talks about this in his memoir. So he, he, he's continually reiterating and repeating this I mean, honestly, just nonsense. Um, and the problem is that because Bernard Lewis has this, uh, um, it, it, because Lewis is has such a prominent uh, uh, position in Middle East studies, especially uh, um, for lay, lay folks, especially for non-experts, people who don't really know much about the Middle East, especially Jews, uh, revere him. I mean, his they, really his ideas are considered almost literally God's divine revelation. And I've experienced this personally with. That honestly, hate messages coming into my inbox probably a couple times a month over the past few months from people telling me Bernard Lewis is this genius. Who are you to be criticizing him or undermining his arguments? Um, and so beca because of his status in the field, um, especially among, again, non-experts. And um, neocons. And, and neocons. And, hmm. and um, you know, his ideas are really have been picked up and repeated, um, not just by, let's call it uh, um, the lay folks, uh, um, non-experts, but also by mainstream politicians, the, the mainstream Republican establishment, Newt Gingrich, Ted Cruz, Mike Huckabee, sh the late Sheldon Adels Adelson, all of these guys have repeated and regurgitated this, this propaganda. And so it's really, I think, become um, almost, uh, almost like mainstream knowledge that Palestine didn't exist and there was no such thing as a Palestinian. Um, uh, so, so that, so that's that's Palestine. Uh, um, now maybe I can just say a brief word or two about yes, Palestine, about the the, the 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 history and origins of how the Palestinian people became controversial. Mm -hmm. um, so, before 1914. Uh, the Arabic term Philistini and Philistinian, the plural, so Palestinian and Palestinians, these were used uncontroversially by Christian and Muslim Arabic speakers in Palestine. I recently put out a paper with Emmanuel Veshka where we found something like 120 references to that term, Philistini or Philistinian, Palestinian or Palestinians in Arabic. So roughly 120 of these references we found it, it before 1914. In Can I just interrupt to, to ask you, did Arab Jews in Palestine use that term as well? That's a good question. I, I don't have any reason to believe why they wouldn't have used it, but just because there were so many fewer uh, you know, Ar Ar Palestinian Jews, Arab Jews in Palestine, let's say at that time, um, I haven't, I, I, I personally have not come across a, a um, a reference to Philistini or Philistinian among the Arab Jews. Um, but but, but you, you don't think in principle there's a reason to think that even they would have uh, rejected this term? 
I don't think so. I think, um, look, it was a new term at the time. It, I, the very first instance I found of this term is 1898. And so in the call it decade and a half between 1898 and say World War One. you know, we've only found 120 references um, to the term. And uh, I don't, and, and and a lot of the Jews at that time were writing in, so the, the, they were writing in Ladino. Um, yeah. I think, uh, was it Hatsfi, Hatshomer, Hatsair? One of the, there were like two or three uh, newspapers in late Ottoman Palestine published by the Jewish community. One of them, I believe, was published in Ladino. I think another one may have been published in, in Hebrew. And so um, in, in those languages, in Ladino and Hebrew, um, it was just less likely they would be using those terms. Philistini, Philistinian was definitely an Arabic term. And there were Arab Jews writing in Arabic at the time, but just so many fewer. And so I haven't come across it. But like I said, I don't have any reason to believe why they wouldn't have used that term for the same reason Christians or Muslims would have used that term. Right. Um, so, but it's a great question, but so, so basically after 1920, um, the British uh, set up this colonial regime, it's an anti-democratic regime, it rejected the, the political will of 85% of the, of the population, and what they do after 1920 is they, um, they introduce the word Palestinian in English to describe the subjects or the citizens of the British mandatory government. All the subjects. All the subjects. And in fact, they're, they're explicit about this because they know the term has already come into use to describe primarily the, the, Arab, uh, the, the Arabic speaking inhabitants, the, the Muslims and Christians and, you know, question mark Jews. And so, and so, in fact, they even specify in, in the 1925 nationality law, I think it's called the Palestinian Law of Nationality, they specify um, this is a, a, a report and a law that uh, is introduced in 1925 written by Herbert Samuel, uh, the British High Commissioner at the time. And the report states that, quote, Palestinian citizenship is enjoyed by all the residents of Palestine, whether Jewish or non-Jewish. Mm -hmm. and, and so the British create this new term that, um, that, of course, bothers some Palestinians. And we have evidence that it bothers them because, uh, for example, um, in 1929, a Palestinian writer, Bishara Mansour, he publishes a book in which he writes... Um, and I'm quoting here, the, it's an Arabic book, but um, the, the English translation is, the Palestinian people consisted of two races, the Christians and the Muslims. Quote, the Palestinian Arabs are no doubt made of two races, not three. Um, okay, and that's a direct quote. And, and you have other Palestinian writers, uh, you have a guy, Gregorius at Hajar, and you have a Rashid Ibrahim who writes similar things. And so already in, say, the 1920s and 1930s, it's pretty clear that Palestinians are, at least some of them, are bothered that their own uh, national identity, their own, say, ethno-national appellation was, was hijacked, was essentially hijacked by the British. And not only was it hijacked, but then it was used to entrench Jewish legal supremacy through the laws of the British colonial regime. And this, so, of course, was at a time of, of growing European Jewish uh, immigration into Palestine. It was within that context. Exactly right. The British uh, colonial regime, it, its explicit purpose, the reason why it exists is to facilitate Jewish immigration and land purchases. And so, and, and obviously Jewish national, uh, sorry, Palestinian nationality, the citizenship you get for being a subject of the British mandatory government, um, you're subjecting yourself to the laws uh, and the ordinances um, of the British mandatory regime, whose purpose is to fulfill the Balfour Declaration and facilitate Jewish immigration to, to, to Palestine. And so you get this. And so that 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 is really the I think I think the origins of the controversy over this term. And so then when in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, you get folks, you get the, the famous Golda Meir quote, there's no such thing as a Palestinian. And and really, and, and, and she even claims like we were we were the Palestinians, right. not the Palestinians, right? It was the Jews who were Palestinians. And so and, and that and that idea just gets carried through all the way to the present. Um, you have uh, um, not just Goldmeier, not just Bernard Lewis, but really all the people we mentioned before, the Daniel Pipes and, and the Mike Huckabees and the Ted Cruz's and the New Gingrich's, all of these people repeat this, this claim, this obviously absurd claim that the Jews were the, the original Palestinians. So um, Palestinians um, don't exist, but somehow the um, Jewish immigrants are Palestinians. Exactly. Um, I, before asking my next question, I just want to apologize to you and our viewers. There seems to be a technical glitch and my picture uh, keeps uh, flashing. So apologies for that. But um, 
what what are the origins of of um or, or rather uh how have the meanings of Palestine and Palestinian evolved in the recent past? Were these static or were they more dynamic concepts? So maybe I could start by saying just a bit about the, uh, call it pre-modern or say pre-mid-19th century meanings or conceptions of those terms. Well, that was that- going to be my next question. Um, so, so please do. I mean, I, I wanted also to get a sense from you, because this is something you also address in in quite a bit of detail in your doctoral dissertation. Um, uh, You know, how how it evolved um, historically. Yeah, so so before, call it the mid 19th century, Mm -hmm. you've got maybe four or five different ways that the term Palestine is being used. And and so the first is, I I would call it really the classic um, Muslim definition of Palestine that you you see repeated in the works of of, of many many uh, Muslim geographers and historians over the years, and so over the centuries, is, over the yeah. centuries, yeah. We're, we're, these that this definition dates to at the very earliest. You could say Yaqubi is using this definition. He's I think nineteenth century, uh, sorry ninth century. Uh, you have uh, Maqdisi, the, the the famous tenth eleventh century geographer. He uses uh, this this term as well, I believe. And, and, and many, many, many writers, uh, Ibn al-Wardi, I believe, in his um, uh, History of Damascus uses this um, definition as well. And, and it, it, the, the, the Muslim uh, uh, analysts and geographers and writers are using a four-point coordinate um, to define Palestine. So they define it as a region f- stretching from Rafah in the south mm-hmm. to Lajun in the north and from Jaffa to Jericho. So they use these four cities as a- Lejeune, uh, I think, is around where Janine is um, located it, today. Exactly right. Um, and, and so that, that's the first, and I would, I would say the most common definition we find in, in Arabic sources over the past, call it 1400 years prior to uh, the 19th century. The second definition is a, de- is a definition I've written uh, about uh, extensively. I published a paper uh, on this topic specifically. It's, it's really that the, the word Palestine is synonymous with the city of Ramleh. And it's, it's, it's hard to find this. It, you really have to dig through sources to find people uh, re- using these two terms interchangeably. But it is a minority view. And it is worth pointing out that, in fact, some people over the years probably thought that Ramleh uh, sorry, that the word Palestine meant and referred to the city of Ramleh. Right. Um, a third definition was a definition I found used by a couple of modern, uh, early modern, so 17th, let's, let's call it 17th, 18th century European writers that use the word Palestine to refer to the coastal plains rather than the mountainous interior. So if you look at Palestine's geography, or the physical geography, I mean, you've got really, you know, the mountainous interior, so uh, D- Jerusalem, uh, Nablus, uh, Hebron, uh, that area, according to these early modern Europeans, was not part of Palestine. And instead, Palestine was limited to just the coastal plains. So Rum, That's Rumland, maybe informed more by their understanding of the Bible and, and, and classical antiquity. That's exactly right. So they have this image of the Bible as the canonical source for understanding geographical lexicons. And so they had this image of, you know, the biblical peoples, the Plishtim, the Philistines, uh, they inhabit the coastal um, plains. And so they think Palestine is the coastal plains. Uh, Exactly right. You have other people who think Palestine and the Holy Land are synonymous. Um, And then you have a fifth definition, I would say, which is more of an Ottoman definition of Palestine, in which you have a number of Ottoman writers seemingly using the word Palestine interchangeably with the Mutasarriflik of Jerusalem. Um, Because remember, in the 1870s, the Ottomans carved out an independent district of Jerusalem. And And it was directly administered from uh, from the Ottoman capital in in Istanbul, rather than as as part of a regional uh, administration. Exactly right. And so it, it's, um, it's, it reports directly to Istanbul. And um, it's pretty clear that some people seem to use those two terms, the Mutasarvik of Jerusalem, as well as Palestine, they use those two terms interchangeably. Right. But of course, all of this um, becomes somewhat irrelevant in uh, uh, after World War One, when the British occupy Palestine. And after the British mandate for Palestine is, is sort of the, the, the country, the government now in charge of Palestine, I would say that all these earlier conceptions of Palestine become obliterated. 
And instead, what you have is this almost this canonical version of Palestine. And everyone seems to really see it as the canonical version of Palestine. In fact, today, people even call it historic Palestine. Right. Um, I'm not really sure why the 26 year period between 1922 and 1948 is historic, whereas the 26 year period after it and before it are irrelevant. But that's just for whatever reason, um, how things have turned out. Right. Um, and then I would just make one last note, which is like today, people, I think, you know, and so, so really the, the, the post 1948 period, you have a couple of developments. I would say that the first development is that in Arabic, I think uh, this is this is anecdotal. I, I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. But I think anecdotally, in Philist- the term Philistine means the same Philistine for most Arabic speakers. Uh, today as it did in 1945 or 1935 or 1925 i think that's what we're in arabic so. mm-hmm. yeah uh, and so i think that 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 uh, the philistine of the british mandate is the same philistine that most people have in mind when they say the word palestine today um there is of course uh, a, another usage of palestine which is that you some people i think use the term palestine to refer to the occupied Palestinian territories, the OPT right. in UN speak or you know international organization speak. Um, it was very I, much a post Oslo development. Exactly, exactly right. So post Oslo, you get this additional usage of the term Palestine, referring to the you know the Green Line, uh, the, the inside the Green Line territories, or say outside the Green Line territories, um, the occupied territories, um, and so that's that's like a new iteration of Palestine, I would say. Right. Um, that's that's really fascinating how you know it has um it's been a very fluid and and dynamic definition but with a very clear geographical core and i find it interesting for example you never mentioned jordan as having been part of palestine whereas you know much of the zionist narrative about the british mandate is actually it included jordan and then that was carved out uh for the arabs because uh palestine was going to be the jewish national home and so on but um, on, on a related point, I'd like you, you spoke briefly about uh, Palestine being southern Syria, um, and and you addressed the origins of the claim that the inhabitants of Palestine, Palestinians, historically referred to their lands as uh, southern Syria. So I guess the first question is, how does this measure against historical reality? And the second is why the, you consider that controversy politically significant. So before 1918, the mm-hmm. phrase Southern Syria in Arabic, Surya al Janubiyya, this mm-hmm. phrase does not appear in Arabic sources. Okay? okay. It is very, very hard to find that phrase in newspapers and books and magazines before ni- or documents before 1918. Mm-hmm. In, in 1918, everything changes. And I do think it's worth dwelling on this brief period for a moment, the 1918 to 1920 period, because it's going to help us put into context how this uh, southern Syria affair came about and why we're, why we're talking about it right now. Right. And why pundits love love talking about the, the the southern Syrian episode. And so remember, it's it's uh, it's not it's uh, World War One, the Ottomans tragically joined the the German war effort. And that puts them uh, against the British, uh, that pits them against the British during the war. And remember, the British had already occupied Egypt in the 1880s. And and so what happens is the British obviously have an interest in occupying the Levant, uh, these lands that are um, currently under Ottoman control. And so what happens is the British famously signed this agreement, the Sharif, uh, the the McMahon uh, uh, Hussein correspondence, and they signed this agreement with the Sharif Hussein of Mecca. Um, and in the agreement, the British, uh, the, the, the Ottoman, uh, the, the, the Sharif of Hussein of Mecca, he agrees to revolt against the Ottomans in exchange for recognition from the British once he revolts and establishes uh, a state and a kingdom. And the then kingdom the, in the Levant. Exactly. And so the, it, 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 he revolts and, uh, you know, uh, uh, go, attacks Ottoman troops, goes up uh, Jordan and establishes a state in Damascus in 1918. And remember, this is this is a big deal. This is after 400 years of Ottoman rule. There's an Arab kingdom. There's an independent Arab state in 
in Bila, in the lands of Sham in Syria. Now it, they don't control that much territory. It's a pretty small state, but in fact, you have an Arab government sitting in Damascus in 1918. And so you have to ask yourself if you're an Arab Palestinian in Jerusalem or or Haifa or Jaffa or Jenin, living and, under and, British rule, living under British rule, yeah. under British military rule. Okay, because right. remember, this isn't a civilian government yet. These are British soldiers occupying the streets of Jaffa and Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Uh, remember the same British government that just adopted the Balfour Declaration mm-hmm. to encourage Jewish immigration and land purchases in Palestine. So ask yourself this, if you're an Arab sitting in uh, uh, Jerusalem or Haifa, um, and your two options are British colonial military Zionist rule from Jerusalem or an independent Arab a government rule from Damascus, what where, what are you going to choose? Very tough choice. <laughs> a tough choice, right? Yeah. And so no surprise, the overwhelming majority of, and it's not even a choice, the overwhelming majority of intellectuals in, in Palestine um, obviously uh, support unity with Syria. And, mm-hmm. and in fact, they go so far as to, um, to, to try to convince the British that there was never even a place called Palestine, that in fact, Palestine was actually called We're part of Syria. Syria. Yeah. We and and part, just on yeah. the score, it's interesting. Um, if, if I'm uh, quoting correctly, the conclusions of the King Crane Commission that was sent by um, uh, President Wilson to the region after World War I to look at what the aspirations of the, of the local population is, um, found that among Palestinians, um, opposition to Zionism was exceeded only by a desire for unity with Syria. Yeah, exactly right. It, it was it was such an obvious choice that there was more consensus around mm-hmm. unity of Syria than there was rejection of Zionism. Um, mm-hmm. And and so what what happened was even after uh, the the fall of, of of the of of the independent Arab kingdom in Damascus, and out of Damascus by the French. Uh, yeah, exactly. They get brutally, uh, violently overthrown by French uh, colonizers. And, and, so, and, and so after 1920, although there's no longer an Arab government in Syria, um, of course, the memory of that government uh, uh, remains. And in fact, there's even this romanticization of it for honestly pretty reasonable reasons, if you ask me. This was a government that was, let's, let's call it uh, local in the sense that it was Arab, not foreign. It was semi-democratic. Uh, you, you might say there was an Assyrian Arab Congress. There was uh, input that was, uh, it was you know, a representative assembly. And so uh, there was this, this longing, you could say, for this Syrian Arab government. And so long after that regime was overthrown violently by the French, you have romantics in Palestine, Palestinian Arabs, pan-Arabists, uh, remembering that period and speaking very fondly of it. And so this, the, the Southern Syrian idea persists in the 1920s and 30s. It's a minority view, right? I think people forget that, yeah, most people turn their attention to Palestine. They realize that Palestine, that this Southern Syrian episode was um, fleeting. It was momentary. It was ephemeral. And that they needed to focus their efforts on Palestine. But of course, it did persist. And so what you have then in the post 48 period in the in the 60s and 70s and 80s 1960s 70s and 80s you get all of these zionists digging up these quotes from palestinian arabs from the 1920s and 30s being like look they were they didn't even believe palestine was a real place or they all thought it was all it was southern syria right. and so it, and ironically uh, um, in their effort to uh, protect palestine from uh, British and colonial and Zionist ambitions, in, uh, like in their uh, in their effort to, to to protect Palestine from Zionist ambitions, they, they sought uh, they sought unity with Syria, which is then used by Zionists to then claim right. they didn't care about Palestine. So right. that's the irony of history. But that that's how the Southern Syrian episode, I, I would say, um, is now embraced by Zionists. Yeah, it is, it's a, it's a fascinating um, uh, story to to hear it recounted the way you just have. Um, and, and turning perhaps to some more distant history, in your doctoral dissertation, you write that the change in nomenclature um, from Judea to Palestina during Roman times is foundational to contemporary campaigns to delegitimize Palestine and the idea of Palestine. And you, in fact, um, you quote you a Zionist leader, Malcolm Honlein, as stating, I thought a little humorously, that the BDS movement, in fact, began 2,000 years ago uh, 
with the Roman Emperor Hadrian during the second century when he changed, supposedly changed this uh, administrative nomenclature. So um, why, why is this considered such an important development? And what did your own research lead you to conclude about this episode? So I would say that it's considered an important development um, because if you're a nationalist and you're a Zionist, then history is relevant to the extent that it confirms your nation's righteousness, right? And so the entire Zionist ideology and mythology is built on this idea that Jews have faced millennia of, of uninterrupted persecution. Um, uh, 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 that, that's the argument. I mean, that literally it's like, hey, Palestinians, sorry about these inconveniences. Sorry about the occupation and the siege and the apartheid, but like we were persecuted. So like, it's not our fault, right? I mean, that, that's literally the argument. Uh, uh, and so what better- Sorry, is sorry, that's so half the argument. The other half, I think, is that um, uh, the Jews have always been a national unit, that, that throughout history, they've also been- um, objectively and subjectively a people in the modern national sense of the term. Exactly right. Yeah, it's, it's, it, th those are two sides to the same coin, right? It's that on the one hand, we were persecuted. And, 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 and on the other hand, we've always been this people. We've always had this a connection to the land of Israel. Um, and so we're, we're just, there's nothing new about our return. We're just coming back to the place we've always longed to come back to. Um, and so, you know, what better a historical episode uh, to highlight if you're a Zionist uh, than uh, to highlight and to embrace and, and also publish academic history papers about than this moment where Jews were ostensibly exiled from the land. Um, not only were they exiled from the land, but their name was ostensibly erased from the historical record. And not only was it erased, but then it was ostensibly replaced with, with the word Palestine. So it's this one historical moment where you, you kind of bundling together all of these little shards of history that when, you, when taken together, paint this really perfect story for the Zionist narrative. Mm -hmm. And almost, almost too good to be true. And so I, it just struck me as something that I felt like I had read a lot of mythology about, but never really read the history itself. And, and so I will confess, by the way, I am not a Roman historian. I do not read uh, a Latin or Greek, um, but uh, it doesn't take long to discover that this story is really built on very shaky foundations, okay? So- um, The story being that, that the Romans um, not only changed the name of, of this territory from Judea to Palestina, um, but that they did so specific, with the specific purpose of eradicating the um, Israelite connection um, to the land. Exactly. So let me, maybe I can narrate from the point of view of, of the Zionist mythologists. Maybe I can first narrate how they would tell that story and then uh, highlight some of the problems with it. And, and so it's, it's 130 CE, the Romans... Um, they banned circumcision, Jews circumcised their, uh, their newborns, they, they Hellenized Jerusalem, and they levy a, a tax on Jews. And so a Roman rule is, is, is repressive, and which inspires rebellion. And so you get this guy Bar Kokhba, who is revered uh, by Jews and celebrated. Um, and, and so he revolts against the Romans, and he takes control of Judea, although not Jerusalem, in 132. And he annihilates Roman troops stationed in Judea. And um, basically, he rules Judea for about two years. And this was quite upsetting to Hadrian, who's the emperor of the Roman, who, who's Roman emperor. And, um, and Hadrian absolutely crushes the revolt uh, with gruesome cruelty. Some of the anecdotes you read in, in, in the sources is that, that he was brutal and, 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 and cruel. And, um, and he, he crushes the revolt in 135. Mm -hmm. And, and so um, after 135, you start to see inscriptions, Roman inscriptions, refer to that territory as Syria Palestina, uh, which translates to Palestinian Syria. Um, so, so instead of calling it Judea, it's called Palestinian Syria. So I think the first point I would make to the propagandists is that it, it, even the, the way the story is narrated, that Palestine replaces Judea is actually false. It was Palestinian Syria as a term, it replaces Judea. So that, that's just like, just getting the facts straight, okay? And then the, there's the question of like, okay, well, the, the argument that the, the, the Zionists are making is they're, they're identifying Hadrian's motives. They're, they're ascribing intention 
and reason behind what what Hadrian why Hadrian did what he did. So the first point is like first of all, we don't even have any direct Adian. We don't even have any direct evidence that Hadrian like explicitly changed the name. Right. What we have is that inscriptions. Uh, uh, start to refer to the place as Palestinian Syria rather than J Judea. But the question is like, why do they do that? Was it Hadrian who uh, changed the name or did people just start calling it that? And that's how the name changed. We don't even know that. It's just speculation. So um, that's the first point um, that we don't even know for a fact that Hadrian changed the name. We, we, we're, 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 we're speculating. The second point is like, okay, why? So let's suppose, let's concede the point that Hadrian changed the name. Okay, why, um, why did Hadrian change the name? Well, Hadrian also had a, 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 an interest and, and a love for Greek culture. And he changed, by the way, lots of other cities, he changed lots of other names in, in the empire from their, uh, their name to, to, their, to their earlier Greek names because he had this fondness for Greek culture. So that was the case with Antigonia, which he, which he changed to Mantinia. That was the case with, uh, uh, with Jerusalem, which he changed to Ilia Capitolina. So th there were lots of na names that were changed by Hadrian. And so there's potentially other motives as well. Um, Both, but, I mean, out, outside this territory as well. Exactly, other, in yeah. other parts of the Roman Empire. Right. Um, and so that's one possibility. I think there's also another possibility, which is that, uh, I sort of hinted to this already, but that there simply was no official renaming at all, that there wasn't a clean break, that instead it, it, one name fell out of use because the Judean uh, state was no longer, and that a, a new name, uh, Palestinian Syria, it came to prominence. And there's actually reason to believe that that is what happened, because not only do we not have any direct evidence that Hadrian explicitly erased his name, but we also see that both of those names, Judea and, and Palestine, or Palestinian Syria, they both appear in sources before 135 CE and after 135 CE. So there's reason to believe just looking at the, 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 uh, um, the evidence, the, the documentary evidence and the inscriptions that, um, that both of these names uh, uh, persisted before and after the ostensible name change. So you're, so you're making the case for kind of dynamic evolution versus administrative fiat. Exactly right. And again, we're, we're all speculating here. None of us know exactly what happened and we never will know what happened because we just don't have that much direct evidence attesting to one thing or the other. But what we can say for certain is that this idea that Hadrian vengefully, in spite of the Jews, erased Judea from history, replacing it with Palestine, that is mere speculation. And it's used and exploited today by Zionists to, to paint this story and this narrative that Zionists have faced uninterrupted millennia of persecution. But, but you did find um, also evidence that Judea um, continued to be used in official documents, official Roman documents after, after it was supposedly um, banned from use? That's a good question. I think the evidence, so the, according to the secondary literature, the evidence is that the, the Judea, you start to really only see, or I don't know if it's only or primarily, but you start to see Judea appear on inscriptions from after 135 CE. I, I would need to dig deeper um, to, to really, to have a more comprehensive look at like, are there still inscriptions that refer to the place as Judea after 135 CE? We would need to double click on that. The evidence that I'm pointing to that suggests Judea is still in use is, is not from the inscriptions, but it's from the um, uh, the history books. Uh, the, um, yeah, the- um, which, which are a good indication in and of themselves, I think. Exactly. So um, if, if we fast forward a bit, um, uh, in your dissert dissertation, you review um, the available historical evidence for the received wisdom that, as, as you were uh, mentioning a bit earlier, that references to Palestine essentially disappeared between late antiquity and modern times. Um, you conclude that the term, in fact, persisted to varying degrees and with varying meanings throughout its supposed 14th century absence. Um, you also found that, as, as I think you were... Uh, referring to briefly earlier, the identification with Palestine remained strongest neither in the coastal territories around Gaza um, that were identified with ancient Palestine, nor Jerusalem with which it would come to be primarily associated, but rather, as, as you mentioned, the town of Ramla, not to be uh, confused with uh, Ramallah. 
How did Ramla become um, such a focus of um, association with Palestine? And I think a lot of people would would think, well, that would be the last place, or at least not the first place one would look for this kind of evidence. Yeah, so it's a great question because you're right. I don't think very many people today associate Ramla with Palestine. But remember, in 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 late antiquity, uh, after Muhammad's followers essentially take over half the world, they um, they inherit many of the Byzantine dis districts that preceded them. And so in the early Islamic period, um, the Muslims established a, a district of Palestine, Jund Philistine, Palestine. which is uh, an, an inheritance of, of, of a Byzantine district. In fact, the Byzantines divided Palestine into, into three sections, uh, like Palestina, Primera, Secondo, and Tertiera. And the Muslims take the Byzantine, I think it's they take this district two and, and it turn into June Philistine. And, and then um, Suleiman Abdel Malik, uh, uh, the, the caliph, um, he actually uh, makes Ramla the seat of power in, in, in the Muslim empire. Uh, during This is during the Umayyad period. Uh, so like uh, early uh, eighth century, hmm. late seventh, early eighth century. And so um, Rumla, and then even after they shift, the, I think they move the capital, I can't remember if it's back to Damascus or to Baghdad, but even after the Rumla is no longer the capital of the empire, it remains the capital of the district of Palestine, June Philistine. And so for a period of about 400 years, Rumla serves as not only the political capital of June Philistine, but it's also incidentally the geographic center of June Philistine. It sits on the main road connecting Damascus to Cairo, and so it becomes a center of trade. And so it's an economic hub as well. And if you read the works of Al-Maqdisi, for example, in the 11th century, you get this sense that Ramla is this vibrant economic center. It's really the economic, not only the political capital, but in the geographical center, but also the economic hub of Palestine. And so, and that's the case for 400 years. This is not like a blip of time. This is like a long period of time. And so what happens after the 11th century, I think in 1068, there's this massive earthquake that just completely destroys the city, kills thousands of people. Rumla is left in, in, total, sh in total shambles. And then a couple of decades later, you have the uh, Crusaders, uh, the first crusade. And so um, at that point, Rumla uh, it falls into a bit of disarray and is in, engulfed in these in these crusader wars, but it, it manages to recover uh, afterwards. And so even during the, the period, uh, let's say, call it the Middle Ages, and even into the early modern period, uh, Rumla retains its, um, let, let's say, not to the same extent that it had before, but it, it, it retains a certain amount of economic uh, importance in the region. And, and so I think that's at least the story I would tell when trying to make sense of the data and the anecdotes that I found from, say, the 12th century all the way all the way up to the 19th century, because you have this is I, I read about this at some length in, in my dissertation and, and, and a paper I published on this specific topic. But you have just an inordinate number of people either from Rumle or from areas around Rumle like mm -hmm. Gaza and Jerusalem. Uh, but really, Rumla is the center. You have a number of, of people who are using the word Palestine from Rumla in their day-to-day -day speech, mm -hmm. in um, just like not in, in a kind of a collated or, or copied uh, a story that they grabbed from, you know, um, say a hadith uh, a commentary from eight centuries right. earlier. They're, they're clearly just using the word Palestine to describe- Colloquially. Colloquially, to describe mm -hmm. their, their place of residence. You see it on a tombstone from Rumla, a 15th, a 16th century tombstone. Um, you see it in the works of Al Khair al Din al Rumli, who uses the term, as well as his son Najm al Din, who also uses the term. You see it in the works of Yusuf Jahshan, an 18th century priest. So it's pretty clear, and, and it's pretty clear that uh, Palestine is the term used to describe the land of Palestine. And we could debate the borders. It's it's not obvious in some cases. Well, but it was used more more consistently in, in Ramla than in, in any of the other cities that you examined during it, this period. It, there's certainly, a, 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 it would certainly be a strange coincidence to see so many writers uh, talking about uh, Palestine and using the term Palestine in, in just to describe the, their place of residence, it would certainly be a, a strange coincidence to have so many people uh, um, from a single place talking right. about Palestine. Now, that, so th that's like one category of people using the term Palestine, talking about Palestine. There's a second category of people, I would call them scholars, 
um, you could call them, yeah, let, let's, just, let's just use the word scholars. But basically, because the Muslim tradition uh, for the first 400 years um, includes June Philistine as part of the, the Muslim empire and its district. Uh, and it, ha it has political importance. What, what happens as a result of that is all of these uh, Hadith commentators, all of these historians, all of these writers of marriage literature, the Fada'il literature, all of these um, biographers of the Prophet, because they're, they're, they're um, writing in this period when Palestine is an administrative district, they're using the term Palestine. And so even after Palestine falls out of use, let's say at the political level from the 11th century onwards, you have this long tradition of, of, of Muslims writing biographies of the Prophet, writing a history of, of the conquests, uh, writing uh, hadith commentaries, um, uh, uh, writing a, a commentaries on the Quran. And, and so what happens is they're using, they're quoting from those earlier sources, from the early which, Islamic period. Which mentioned Philistine. Which yeah. mentioned Philistine. And so there's literally no 10 year period in all of Islamic history where you can't find someone using the word Palestine in something they've written. Let um, alone a 1400 year gap. Uh, yeah, it's, it, and, so, and so I think for the same reason, for example, someone studying uh, Lebanon in uh, say late antiquity might use the word Phoenicia. And, and you and I understand what the word Phoenicia is, even though we probably call it Lebanon, not Phoenicia. Right. For that, for the same reason, a Muslim scholar in the 18th century or the 15th century would have known what Palestine was for the same reason you and I know what Phoenicia is. Right. That's, that's really fascinating. Um, and and on, on this point, I'd also, again, like to refer to uh, a point you addressed earlier and perhaps expand on it. Um, because it, in your thesis, you also discuss the claims of uh, Bernard Lewis and Daniel Pipes, let's call them the village idiots of Palestine studies, um, that prior to the British mandate, um, Jews refused to use the term Palestine, while additionally, Arab Muslims and Christians supposedly considered the term, I think in Lewis's words, unacceptable. And Pipes goes, to, goes so far as to claim that Palestinian Muslims found the term repugnant and that prior to 1920, only Palestinian Christians used that term. You paraphrase Pipes as claiming Palestine was repugnant to hundreds of thousands of people in 1919 and then embraced by them in 1920. Um, what, what in your view are they seeking to achieve with the sectarian histography, historiography? And how do their claims measure against the historical evidence? Yeah, so yeah, it's it's weird that they, that um, th that Bernard Lewis and, and Daniel Pipes are using these words like unacceptable or repugnant, repugnant, because as I said uh, already, it there's just no evidence for that whatsoever. Um, and, and so I, honestly, it's just just strange that they would make these arguments with literally zero evidence. Now, the reason why I think they are making these arguments is because they're nationalists. And nationalists believe that nations have inherent or innate self-determination self rights in their national homeland. And so they believe that they're strengthening their nationalist claim to this land by claiming there was no Palestine. And, and, and all the more so if they can somehow claim that the Arabs were hostile to, to, to the idea of Palestine, that they're somehow bolstering Jewish claims to, to Israel, right? Um, of course, I mean, the, the, there are a lot of problems with this. I mean, the first problem is that giving Jews special political rights in Israel-Palestine has nothing to do with what Arabs thought about geog what the Arab geographical lexicon was. I mean, the problem is that it's bigoted to give one ethno-national religious group more political rights than another group. Um, and, 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 and that's just inherently a bad idea, in my opinion. And so, I, I, again, if you believe that nations are these special groups of people that have inherent political rights, you might come to the conclusion that, oh gosh, we really need to strengthen our own national claims. And, and, and in Israel-Palestine, what that means in practice is it means undermining the Palestinians' claims to this land. And so they, and so you get this school of thought to delegitimize any type of connection that Palestinians have to Palestine. So, um, yeah, and 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 in terms of the, the actual historical record, you're basically saying um, there is no evidence. But I, I would like to get back once again to this Muslim Christian 
dichotomy because I think you gave a um, you looked into this in in detail. Um, and interestingly, I think you found that the term first became current in a, um, a Russian school in uh, in Nazareth, um, rather than I mean many people would have maybe assumed it would be more um, through uh, British or French schools, but you then tie that into an explanation why um, there's really no nefarious or even sectarian explanation for any existing Christian Muslim uh, dichotomy and, and references to Palestine during that period. Yeah, so th th there is this tendency among the Daniel Pipes and Bernard Lewis's of the world to somehow differentiate between the Muslim and the Christian usage of the term Palestine. And so they might say that um, maybe Christians use the term, but you know they were a minority. They're only like ten percent of Muslims. Doesn't uh, really matter. Yeah. Doesn't matter. In fact, Muslims never use the term. Um, so, so, I, and so the, the the argument that they would make is that if you look at the uh, press and the publications and the magazines from the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries, they're mostly Christians using the term, including, for example, the references you just made to in this Russian missionary school, um, the Khalil Beras, the Najib Nasar, and the Salim Kobain references. These guys are all Christian, um, and so there's this question of like, wait, how come how come it's Christians using this term? Now, I think what you have to remember here is that from the late 19th century, mid to late 19th century onwards, you have all these missionaries, Christian missionaries coming, American Christian missionaries, Russian Orthodox Christian missionaries. Um, you, you have German Christian missionaries, French. They're all Christian. And they set up these schools in the Ottoman Empire and offer education primarily to Christians. And so all of these, um, all of these young Arab pupils are getting exposed to all of these uh, Western political, uh, Western geographical uh, concepts, including Palestine. And so that's one reason you see this term being used by a lot of Christians. By the way, the other reason why Christians get involved in the press and uh, and are in the publishing industry at a much earlier point, I think, in, in history than Muslims do, is owing to um, is is owing to how the Ottoman Empire uh, uh, hires and promotes bureaucrats. Because remember, getting into if you if you wanted to start a newspaper in the 1880s or 1890s or 1900s, good, luck. <laughs> good like you had to be a pretty crazy entrepreneur because this was a new industry. It was not really clear how you're going to make a profit, huge capital expenditures. Where the heck do you even get a printing press from in, in 1908? And so it, what ends up happening, and so if you're a Muslim, you're like, yo, I can get a government job. I can get paid really well and go become a bureaucrat. And that was the route for, or, or the alternative route for Muslims to get kind of secure employment was, was through the courts. I could become a judge. Um, and so if you're a Muslim and you want economic security, then you either become an Ottoman bureaucrat, so you go to an Ottoman school and then try and enter the Ottoman bureaucracy, or you go the route of the courts and try and become a scribe or, or a judge. And, and those are the most secure uh, um, forms uh, and most, uh, let's say, uh, uh, ways to, to sort of secure your economic prosperity in future. And what, so what happens is if you want to find if you want to find all the Muslims writing about Palestine, you have to go to the Ottoman archives in Istanbul. And over there, you will find not hundreds, but thousands and thousands and thousands of documents from the 1860s all the way to the 1920s, where they're writing and talking about Palestine. But if but, you limit your research to the press. Yeah, but if you limit your research to the press, guess who went and and started these newspapers, they were mostly Christians because they didn't have that same access to the government bureaucracy jobs because those were primarily limited for uh, to Muslims because this, the Ottoman Empire did not treat all of its citizens equally. It promoted and uh, 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 it promoted Muslims in the bureaucracy more so than it did Christians or Jews. And so, and so, yeah, the newspapers were founded by Christians and then you have the Christian schools. And, and so you do see more uh, references from Christians in the press and, and, and just the, the books published, say, from the 1880s onwards. And that's, that's why you have the preponderance of Christian sources, which is why you have people like Bernard Lewis and Daniel Pipes saying, oh, it was the Christians, not the Muslims. But they just didn't, they just weren't looking in the right place, I would say. Right. Yeah. Um, finally, uh, Zach, um, the title of your thesis, The Invention of Palestine, I mean, the title would be right at home on the cover of an APAC pamphlet. Um, even as you successfully dismantle core myths about the historical evolution and use of the term. So on the one hand, you seem to be saying uh, 
that all place names are by definition invented terms and Palestine is in this respect no different from any other. At the same time, you make the argument that place names are invented precisely to give human meaning um, to geographical space. So what are the broader conclusions that your study of this particular place uh, raises? Yeah, so first of all, I really appreciate this question because I, I got a little bit of pushback from some folks. So why are you calling it the invention of Palestine? Like, what do you mean it's invented? Like, that sounds like Zionist propaganda to me. And by the way, the reason I chose that was because I wanted Zionists to read my dissertation. OK, <laughs> if you already uh, if you're already sympathetic to the Palestinians, I'm just not as interested in reaching you. And so, by the way, that was intentional. And I do realize that it, it is probably controversial to say this. But at the same time, I mean, let, let's be honest with ourselves here all places, all geographical places, Palestine, Germany, Israel, France, these are all invented concepts, okay? We just made them up. If you look at the soil on one side of the Jordan River, it's the exact same soil as the soil on the other side of the Jordan River. This is, Palestine is just an idea that human beings made up and have given meaning to over the years. And so to, to your question, like, why is it that we're, we give meaning to this geographical space? I, I guess I would say that, um, what I've observed in, in, in looking at uh, the case of Palestine is that I don't think that big geographical spaces play a very important role in most people's lives for most of history. And I think that's owing to our biological limitations. I have two eyes. Even if I stand up on a really tall mountain, I can't really see all of Palestine. I could probably see the city of Damascus or, or the city of Jerusalem or my village. I can, of course, see and touch and feel my family and my uh, uh, my extended uh, um, network, my patronage network. Um, I, I have a much stronger connection to um, people who I have, uh, say, a religious connection to because I'm doing all these religious things. I'm going to mosque, I'm praying. So I think these things like religion, uh, call it clan or tribe or patronage network, call it family, um, call it village and city and town, all of these things are just much more important to most people for most of history. And I think really that starts to change in, depending on the place, I think it starts to change when, first of all, with the introduction of maps. I think maps are so critical here because a map allows you to visualize what your eyes are incapable of visualizing. You can see this massive place. Oh, well, look, it's Palestine. There it is. I can see it. There it is. It's on a piece of paper. It's in a map. It's hanging up on my school wall. I was, as Apparently was you have quite the collection. <laughs> yeah, we, I can, uh, I can show you some maps maybe after uh, we uh, we stop recording. But you know, I I love maps. Obviously, um, I collect them. I I buy them. I, I travel to Istanbul for the sole purpose of buying up old maps, old yeah. Ottoman maps. I just absolutely love maps, and I think uh, for the, for the same reason that I love maps, I think a lot of people when they see the map when they, they can now visualize their identity on paper. Um, and so that plays a critical role. And so I really think if you just plot it out, um, identities based around big geographical spaces, that, let's suppose that was the, um, the x-axis and the y-axis was the printing and proliferation and distribution and spreading of maps and atlases in human history, that graph would just look like a, a line up until the right. The more maps there are in circulation, the more people are seeing them, the more likely it is people are going to be identifying with these big places. That's one, that's one uh, I think, very important trend. A second trend is not just maps, but think of the longer tale of geography books and history books that give Palestine, uh, 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 that, that endow Palestine with meaning and purpose and give it a sense of continuity and coherence. Now there's a books called the history of Palestine, the geography of Palestine. This makes Palestine feel real. It makes it feel coherent. And it, it gives Palestine this sort of contiguous history. First, there was Palestine during the Roman period. Then there was Palestine during the Byzantine period and the Islamic period and the Crusader period and the Ottoman period. It, 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 it sort of gives you this narrative of Palestine as this coherent, contiguous place. Um, and I think, so if you trace, again, the proliferation and distribution of history and geography books, you'll see a similar slope up and to the right. And, and I think then what happens in, and then the, the, the third, and let's say that the final point I would emphasize here is that states themselves play such a critical role in, in creating identities based around those states, right? And so you have, of course, 
um, already in the late 18th and 19th century, you have lots of people talking about Palestine and, and, and Palestine as a state. And this is pre-British mandate. This is before there even was a state. You have European consuls talking about a potentially an independent Palestine state. You have murmurings in the Arab press, people talking about an independent Palestine state. You have Ehsan Turjuman in his diary in 1915 asks, is Palestine after the war going to be taken over by British and turned into a British state? Or maybe it gets connected to Egypt? But basically, what happens over the course, I think, of the last few decades uh, prior uh, to, to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire is more and more people are talking about Palestine as a state, a potentially independent state. And that leads to more and more discussions of Palestine. And, and, then, and, and so once a geographical term starts to gain traction, as maps proliferate, as geography and history books proliferate, what you get as a result is institutions, organizations, stores, companies, scouting troops start to use the term Palestine in their lexicon. In 1910, you get the Palestine Educational Bookshop. Already in 1911, you which have- still around. Which is still around. Yeah, exactly right. I think it's Salah Dean Street, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and so you have tons of these institutions now using the term. And then of course, by 1920, by the time the British declare Palestine a state, you, you might already say it's fait accompli, that the history has been sealed at this point. And it, it's almost hard to imagine us using a different term today, right? We, the, the term has become so ingrained into our consciousness. It, 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 the term Palestine probably appears in print and appears on screen and appears in email letters, in newsletters, and appears on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and, and, and every single other social network probably millions of times a day. It, it would almost be unimaginable for us to stop using that term and call it something else. And so at this point, it's, 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 it's hard to imagine a world without Palestine. But I think it is important to remember that it took it took the maps and the atlases and the history books and geography books and the institutionalization of Palestine over the course of many, many decades for us to get to where we are today. Um, Zachary Foster, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank you once again for sharing your insights and expertise with Connections. It's been an absolutely fascinating uh, discussion. And I'd just finally like to apologize once again for um, these ongoing uh, technical glitches to both uh, you and our viewers. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me on. Great. So.